Uh, well, all right. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our November 2022 first astronomy club meeting. We meet every second Thursday of the month, 7 30 at Penn State for Experimental 101. Um, tonight, we had our lecture provided to us by a club member, and we are lucky to have him here with us. We're lucky uh, in that you know he is from our community, but also has done stuff that is, uh, you know, let's say far above and beyond uh, you know, the ground. That's very good. Uh, we'll get into that. You'll see uh, and come to learn more about this mission, which, oh boy, uh, I'm very excited about. Um, I know we have really cool infrared telescopes that just launched, but that doesn't mean the other ones uh, haven't had an impact uh, at Delta Arecibo. But anyway, without further ado, I'd like to thank Keith Duda for joining us. Thanks, Elon. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, my name is Keith Duda. I know some of you, and I think there's some new people here also. Um, I've been an old member of the club and a new member of the club. Um, and this is a new event for me, so I thought I would share it with both uh, the club and some other people too. So uh, hopefully... Technical problem. I can't seem to do anything. Okay, maybe that's it. Yeah, we're good now. We're good. <clears throat> um, that, that is indeed uh, me there a good 20 plus years ago. Um, I have been interested in astronomy since probably like middle school, and, and this actually is my very first astronomy book that, that I bought whoa, way back when they had bookstores. Um, and it was really simple, but I, I loved it a real lot. Uh, and this is still the current telescope that I most often use. Uh, I got my education in physics from Penn State. Uh, I did not go to this campus aside from just one class uh, when I was student teaching. Uh, but ever since college, I've been teaching physics, most recently chemistry, and I've been doing astronomy for about 10, 15 years. And actually, this is my first astronomy classes field trip to the Reading Planetarium. Uh, so I'm jumping around a little bit, but the talk is supposed to be about SOFIA, which is this flying infrared telescope. And I first learned about it uh, a good decade or so ago at a teacher convention. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. The teachers get to go on this, but it was only for teachers in Los Angeles. So I was like, oh, bummer. And I just went about my business. And then I found years later that they were accepting other teachers from all over the country. And I applied and I got accepted and I was scheduled to fly in April of 2020. Yeah, April of 2020. And we know what happened in March of 2020. <clears throat> so it got canceled for that. Even after COVID, when I was rescheduled to fly again on a mission, they had an equipment failure where one of the instruments on the airplane just died and they had to fly back to base, uh, remove it, work on it for a week. And so I finally got to actually fly on two missions in spring, uh, this spring of 2022. So um, that's a little bit about me and, and I'll do just a little bit about infrared astronomy in general, and then a little bit about the whole SOFIA mission stuff and, and where it is today. Uh, so we probably know a little bit about the electromagnetic spectrum. If you're into astronomy, you really like visible light, uh, but there's all these other lights uh, to the sides of them that exist too, even though I can't see them. Um, maybe you're familiar with like the Chandra Space Telescope that does X-rays, uh, maybe like the Spitzer Space Telescope that does infrared or whatever, but there's definitely um, uh, other ways to observe these things. And... Um, this was discovered way back in the day uh, by Sir William Herschel in, I think it was exactly 1800. And if you've ever judged middle school science fair projects, this is one that you see a bazillion times over. Uh, you take some sunlight, put it through a prism, you get a rainbow on a sheet of paper, and then with little tiny thermometers, you check the temperature of all of those lights, and they're different. And then you put another thermometer, I can't quite see if this is red, but past the red, beyond the red, where there is no visible light. And oh my goodness, the temperature goes up. 
So this guy had discovered that there is light beyond what we can see. And I don't know if he called it, but, but it's called infrared light. Something like two years later, they discovered ultraviolet too, past violet. So uh, this is kind of good for us for astronomy because we're probably familiar with Orion. We know what it looks like minus the blue lines. And that's invisible light. But if you look at Orion infrared, you can barely even make out the Orion that we know. There's all this other stuff that's to us for visible light completely invisible. So it's kind of literally like a whole new universe out there when we look at wavelengths other than visible light. Uh, the public loves visible light because we get pretty pictures, but all the other ones are important too. Oh, and by the way, I was going to mention, if we are such a nice small group here, if you want to ask questions and say anything at all, please do. I mean, I'll ask for questions at the end, but do not be afraid to just yell out. So uh, one way I can prove to you that all this stuff exists and actually give you a good firsthand view is with an infrared camera. So I'm going to try and stop sharing this part and switch to sharing what we can see, I think, from this infrared camera. So. So you are looking at what's in front of the table here. It's a couple of plastic pieces. There's a pane of glass. And I'm going to take some, and you can probably see me. There you go. So I clearly look a lot different than the surroundings. Now, am I orange? Nah. But the computer or the camera has decided to make something that's hotter like me make it, I guess, whitish, yellowish, orange. Things that are cool happen to look darker colors like So even though it's plain old water, it looks clearly like a different color. You can even take ice cubes and do things like, uh, yeah, you can even write on the countertop with the ice cube. On the other hand, this is supposed to be hot water that I brought from home. Hot water. <laughs> this one's the hot. Um, so we can clearly see the difference in temperatures. So we've got this camera that we can see all this interesting stuff. Now, a lot of times there's things that you really wouldn't expect. I think people are used to this because they see pictures of like, this is the technology that military helicopters and soldiers use to see at night. Not even like regular night vision, but this is the equivalent of thermal night vision. And I'm hoping I can take this, show you where I was standing. And those are not my feet, those are my footprints. That's why I took my shoes off. You might've thought I was weird, but it was really bad. <laughs> so I'm gonna tilt this a little bit, hopefully towards me. Is this not a web telescope? This is a super crude version. It's not even a one megapixel camera, but I would think so, yeah. So, and you see me? Yeah, you can kind of see. I'm going to sit down this one. All right, so. I'll go this way. This way. Okay, that's it. I do kind of want to be centered because you can clearly see me on the infrared camera. And you can see me with visible light too. And you can see me through this pane of glass with visible light. But if you notice with the infrared camera, Infrared light doesn't go through, go through glass at all. I I'm gone, which seems really weird because we're so used to visible light going through there, but infrared doesn't. And this is one of the reasons behind Sophia. Um, infrared light gets absorbed by all, not the glass on Earth, but all the water vapor of the atmosphere. So we want to get above all of this stuff so it doesn't block us, so we can actually see the infrared light from space. On the complete other hand, I don't know if there's any kids listening at home, but don't try this at home. A garbage bag looks pretty darn opaque. You can't see me through it. But with infrared light, you can probably see me right through the garbage bag. And, and is it working? Because I can't yeah. see it because I'm in the garbage bag. <laughs> and so this is, I don't know if you can hear me. 
Um, this is a, a good thing for infrared light. So if we're looking at things like newly formed planets or solar systems that are all dusty, this is the equivalent of the dust. We might not be able to see it with visible light, but infrared light goes right through the dust and we can see things that we normally can't. So this is kind of supposed to be my justification for why we all love infrared astronomy and why it's important and good. So, sound good? So I'm gonna turn the camera off now. And if when we're done, you wanna play with the camera yourself, you can even take pictures of yourself uh, and send them to people or whatever. My students love taking pictures of themselves with these that they think it's the best thing in the world. Share again, under here, under here. So am I back to normal? I think. Elon, am I good? Okay. Uh, so this is actually a picture of one of my students and you can tell she wore glasses. Just like with the glass, the infrared light doesn't go through the glass very well, the glass says. And you can tell this is the COVID year, she's got her mask on and that's stopping an awful lot of the, uh, the infrared light from the face. <clears throat> So here's a nice nifty little chart where we can see that visible light right here goes all the way down to the surface of the Earth from space. And other types of light, like radio waves, they do exactly the same thing. But some types of light, like gamma rays, they don't get there at all. And infrared light in this big long uh, ellipse or whatever is kind of halfway in between. There are some um, shorter wavelengths of infrared light that do make it to the ground from space. That's why we can put infrared telescopes like uh, in Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and we can see you know, measures of infrared light. But some of the other wavelengths never ever get to even Mauna Kea, which is like 13,000 feet up. So what do we do? We either put a telescope in space or we put an airplane 45,000 feet up. So that's kind of literally halfway in between. Uh, not exactly halfway in between, but it's the option that's halfway in between. This is kind of a very similar diagram. And this is transmission here. So you can see from Mauna Kea, there's an awful lot of zero transmission. There's an awful lot of light that does not make it through. You go up in Sophia and look, we can see a lot more of this picture compared to what's obscured there. So again, all of this is supposed to uh, illustrate how something like Sophia, it's got a purpose, it does something good and uh, it, it works. So this is SOFIA, which is the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Uh, NASA loves acronyms. Uh, it is a 747, just like you may have flown on. Uh, it was built, I think, in the 60s or 70s. It used to be a commercial one. Uh, it got sold to NASA. Um, obviously, it did not come with the telescope. They had to put that in. That's an aftermarket accessory. Cost extra, too. Um, and it is a big airplane. Uh, the wingspan of this airplane is longer than the Wright brothers' first entire flight in an airplane. So this is a big airplane. Um, the telescope inside is bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and it's actually, it was made by the German Space Agency, not us. This whole thing you might see, oh yeah, there's a little symbol here, it's the VLR. That's the equivalent of Germany's NASA. So they built the telescope and we did pretty much all the other stuff. As SOFIA has operated for the past 10 plus years, uh, it would go over to Germany every so often for them to use it. And it also even flew to places like New Zealand, Fiji, and maybe a couple other exotic places. I didn't get to go to any of those places. This is an inside shot of it, and you can see a bunch of stuff. And it's actually also the same thing as this model, which you can take a look at if you want. Um, you can pass it around if you want. It opens up so you can see what's on the inside of it. And um, it's not a lot like the regular 747. There's not that many seats. Uh, there are maybe 20 seats. Um, this whole section here is the telescope. This whole section here is the instrument. Is that okay? <laughs> um, yeah, as a teacher, it's hard to stay in one spot. I'm just not used to doing that. Um, but the, uh, the teacher's seats where we saw it, sat on the flight were right there. Uh, it looks like there's a set of staircase, there's a staircase, which there is, and there is an upper floor. When the um, airplane was originally flying, it was a piano bar. 
but it's not there anymore. Uh, unfortunately, you can't get to the uh, telescope. I think it might be on the next slide, but yeah, it is always sealed off the bulkhead. The telescope is exposed to the air. It's not pressurized at all. And even this nice door, that's only opened up there at uh, altitude. When it takes off, it's always closed. When it lands, it's always closed. Uh, most of even the crew never see the telescope. I, I was very upset by that. I felt, ugh, can't even see the telescope. <laughs> only one time ever was the door open when it landed because it got stuck. And they were really worried that, you know, like uh, a bird was going to poop on it or something. Or right into it, you know, that could be a problem. This is where they keep it. It's a really big building. It's a building so large that they've actually filmed movies in there before. Um, and it houses not only Sophia, which is this big one, it houses a whole bunch of other NASA aircraft that get used for like um, photography and measurements of like uh, geology stuff. Uh, that's not really my field, but I know they did all sorts of measurements for that. Where is that building? Uh, it's in Palmdale, California. It, it's not a NASA base. They actually uh, lease it from the Air Force. It is right next to an Air Force base, uh, which we weren't allowed to take pictures of. Even though when Sophia took off, I saw a B-2 stealth bomber there, and we weren't supposed to look at that either. So I just averted my eyes. <laughs> so before I went up in the aircraft, like anybody else, you've got to do safety training. Uh, it's a little bit more than what the stewardess does when she shows you to put your seatbelt together. Uh, one of the things we had to do was learn how to use a mobile personal oxygen system. It's basically the oxygen system you put over your head, and you can't see out of that, believe it or not. Um, and there might be, yeah, there's another shot here. You didn't have to walk around with these, but these did, they existed, so you're supposed to grab them. Uh, Sophia flies over water a real lot, so it's at least a possibility that it could have landed uh, in water. Maybe the video will work. Yay. So one of the fellow teachers. And those are powered by like a regular CO2 two cylinder that you might use in a BB gun. And that's what expands it to make it float. Uh, like on a regular 747, there's these big other chutes which detach and can be uh, boats for you. Um, we didn't use those, of course, but they're there. Um, something that I thought was kind of cool, which I did not get to use, but we got trained on, was this thing. Take a look at this. Inside the cockpit. Move your right foot. Step onto the base of the second observer seat and with your left foot on the step. Climbing up the cockpit. Climb out of the hatch and sit on the lower hatch frame. This is the fun part. Hold the handle of the wheel with both hands. Keep your arms stretched and lie down with your back towards the fuselage. On the ground, immediately. So you're supposed to do that. Side. And that would be like if the airplane was crooked or something, or like you couldn't get to the other doors, that's how you get out the top. Okay. Oh, that's pretty cool. Gravity. Gravity, yes. Uh, so this is probably the day before one of my missions. Um, we got to, you know, do tours of it, look at it, figure out where we're going. Uh, there was lots of other safety training too. Um, and I just kind of liked the nice shot. Um, yeah, that, that is not towards the Air Force Base, so that's legal. So they didn't want us to take off or sit in the cockpit, but I just snuck in there. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. They, the, uh, one of the flight crews said that we could each sit in the co-pilot seat. Uh, get an impression for all the dials and gadgets and knobs that are in there, and, and it was just amazing. Uh, typically, the co pilot is there, the pilot's over here to the left, and there's a flight engineer, and there's one more seat, which is where sometimes the teachers or other personnel got to sit uh, if they wanted to see takeoff or landing or just talk to the flight crew. Uh, from the flight crew's perspective, uh, flying Sophia around is really kind of boring. Uh, they're not doing all the telescope stuff. Um, what they do a lot of when they're checking in with air traffic control, and I heard this when I was up there, uh, other airport towers, uh, they'd say, hey, and it was called NASA 747 Heavy. What are you doing tonight? What are you looking at? Well, what are you actually seeing? And everybody was very interested in Sophia, meaning like the other airplanes. So before we take off, we had to do a flight briefing. 
with everybody. This is the mission director, pilot. Uh, I think that guy was actually the doctor which was on the airplane. But everybody gets together. We talk about the science stuff. What targets are we going to look at? Which I think might be on the next slide. Yeah, you can see up here, this is one of the targets from, I think, the first mission, and it's the jellyfish nebula. Uh, you might be, can't read a heck of a lot below it, uh, but I'll talk about how the, the missions that I went on were spectroscopy. They weren't just pictures. Uh, they talk about weather. Uh, this might be a, a second target. They usually, I would say, did maybe four or five targets a night. So it's not like when some people do astrophotography and they do like 10 hours of exposure, they try and get a lot of stuff in in one night to help out this scientist and the scientist and whatever else you're doing. And uh, I'm on the list of the So I believe this is just a plain old takeoff. The night before I went up, looks like we were airplane from the ground. People that are observing that wouldn't think anything different. But I thought it was pretty impressive because I knew that was the airplane that had the huge telescope that I was going to get to visit. Uh, this is uh, beginning to go up over San Francisco. And Sophia can go all the way up to 45,000 feet, which is a lot higher than most commercial traffic. Um, it's not a matter of they want to stay away from the other airplanes. They want to get as high up as they possibly can to get above as much water vapor as they possibly can to make it as clear as possible. In fact, usually the scientists are radioing to the mission director who asks the pilot, can we go up even higher? They always want to go up higher. And it's not that the airplane's going to explode, but it doesn't work as efficiently up high. And so usually the pilot would say something, well, okay, I'm not going to give you 45, but I'll give you 43. And they're like, okay, 43.5? And they, they, they listen. <laughs> this is one of the co-pilots that I flew with and brought these company, kind of back chips up. Um, the cabin and all the places we are are pressurized, but it is pressurized to a height equivalent to 7,000 feet. So that's a lot different air pressure than we're feeling right now. So when he takes the bag of chips up there, it's being exposed on the outside to a much lower air pressure, and it looked like it was about to pop. In fact, it only took a little bit of a push from him to actually pop the bag, and then he and the pilot just picked out. It's like they'd never seen food before. Um, it's understandable because these flights are really long. They're like, 10 or so hours long. So you're bringing food on. Uh, some people even take short little naps, not the people flying the airplane. Um, there, there's bathrooms. Uh, at the end of one night, we even all the whole crew actually played a trivia game, which was kind of fun because they were done. This is the instrument. Um, this one is actually called that XEs. It's a spectrograph. Um, this whole enormous thing. Uh, which is attached to the telescope is the equivalent of you when you use your phone to put up to a telescope and take a camera. It's just bigger and better and different. That's all. Um, the good thing about Sophia and other uh, instruments like this is that we can change instruments. Um, yeah, this one is completely different than these other three. Um, this one measures polarized light. I can't remember what these two do, but this is the one from Cornell, and this one was made in Germany. Uh, this is the one that cracked out on me, which canceled my one flight. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was really actually interested in this because it was going to make measurements of the magnetic fields and galaxies, and I was actually going to use that with my electricity and magnetism physics class. But that's okay. It's all very good. So when the uh, teachers have a little console, this is what we see. We literally get to see the guiding camera of the telescope. This is a bunch of stats of the airplane and what's going on. Uh, it's very dark on the other side. But I'll give you some other pictures. On Sophia, it is super loud, like super loud. I would have to scream to you for anybody to hear me because we don't have 200 seats and people to absorb all the sound. So everybody's got to use a communication system with a bunch of buttons and headsets on. Otherwise, you can't hear anybody. Um, I was kind of a little bit afraid of hitting this button, which means you can talk to everybody in an emergency. And so I tried not to touch that button. Um, but generally, it was actually pretty easy. The different channels were for different people. So if you want to talk to the mission director and ask to go talk to the pilot, you just hit a button and say, uh, EPO to MD, can I go visit the pilot? Uh, so yeah, this is a little bit of a view down the actual airplane there. 
And uh, this is a view of another one of those consoles where the telescope operators were. Uh, these two, and I say young ladies, uh, because they were not too far out of uh, undergraduate school. They're the ones that were operating the telescope. So they literally pointed it where it had to be. Uh, they didn't control the instrument, but they controlled the telescope, which is really important. And they actually did a super good job because one night we had turbulence that made things all bad. But they got to point the telescope so quickly that they made up for all the lost time so that nobody got any lost data or anything like that. So on my screen, you might hear some noise. If you look through a telescope or take astrophotos, that's the kind of thing you see all the time, and it's the same deal with Sophia also. Can you play that again? Yeah, sure. And you might see there's a square around this thing. I'm not positive. I think this is the star they're guiding on. And so they're keeping the telescope pointed at their object so they can take an extended exposure for whatever they're doing. Uh, these here are the, there's a couple people you can't really see this one guy. These are the scientists, usually like a, a PhD astronomer that's doing the actual research. Uh, he or she is in charge of the instrument and is basically saying like, I wanna get this picture. I wanna get this length of exposures. This one was bad, let me do another one. And then, Sometimes the mission director says, oh, no, you're done, or, or whatever. Okay, now this is actually one of my most interesting parts, I think. I, I wondered when I first got into this, how on earth can they go from an airplane that's going around and make it point in something like absolutely steady? Because when I try and take astrophotos, if I like sneeze on the telescope, it doesn't work right. You get all kinds of bad things. And so the deal is really that they're not making the uh, airplane stay steady the telescope is staying in one spot and the airplane moves all around it. It's basically a matter of inertia. The telescope is just staying put and the airplane is free to move around it. And you'll sort of see it here a little bit. That's the telescope staying in one spot and the airplane going around. And it's all because of, this is not a great picture, but this is the best one I could get. Uh, this sort of bearing here. This makes the whole thing sort of stay connected, but like all. Yeah, yes, yep. Um, th this was basically one of the hard parts of like building the whole system. Um, and it works really well, uh, but of course the airplane can only move so far around it. So sometimes, like I said, when there's turbulence, the airplane would move too much and they would have to reset the whole thing and, and move it and restart and you know, that's the way life goes. Uh, this is when the airplane is not having a problem, but when they're just moving. And so you see these big long trails, and that's kind of like when I take astrophotos when things get all crazy. So I found that out. There's also places on Sophia where you have other people that just might be sitting, looking at data, or even eating pizza. Like I said, it's a big long mission, so it's a whole day of work, and it was really tiring. Um, I'm used to like regular, you know daytime shift hours and staying up all night long was really hard, especially when we got back at 7 a.m. and then I couldn't go to sleep. I, I couldn't imagine I couldn't go to sleep. Um, this is kind of like a view down the whole thing. These couple of guys that you can barely, barely see here, they're the mission director, so they're the guys in charge. Um, and they also are fairly young. Uh, they are not PhD astronomers, um, I think. One of them was an engineer, the other might have a degree in either physics or astronomy, they might have been astrophysics. Uh, but, but they're there basically there because they've worked in a variety of fields, so they're really good at coordinating all the different people and requests and tasks. Uh, they had a really diverse background. They talked to uh, the teachers. Uh, about. At the end of the night, almost for dawn, uh, this high-tech picture was taken with my phone out the window, and it's the moon, Jupiter, and Venus. I thought it was really nice because you know we were coming back all done and it just looked really pretty. So this is right after that picture we landed. We got off. We were heading off probably for like the final briefing when we were done, and it just looked really nice. 
So uh, one last thing that I did was I had a, on purpose, a bottle of water that was capped up. So when I came back down to this higher pressure, it got squished. Uh, these are some of the things that I taught with my uh, AP chemistry class about when we learned about gases and pressure. <clears throat> I found signs everywhere. NASA is apparently paranoid or run by lawyers because they're afraid of everything. You've got to watch out for all of these things. There seems to be danger everywhere. <laughs> and then there's even more here. Like there's everything. I mean, it's just like every step you take, you must be careful. Um, and I exaggerate a little bit, but there really was a lot of uh, heavy objects and there were dangerous chemicals. The fire suppression system was dangerous. Uh, it's, it's a serious business. So um, all of the teachers, when we finished our mission, we couldn't go home that exact morning because we had been up for like 24 hours. So we basically got an extra day there. And one of the things that one of the local teachers who was from the LA area decided to take us to, to drive us, you know, with their own vehicles to the California Science Center. And this was great because they'd got the space shuttle there. I was like, wow, this is really great. When they said like, do you want to make an extra trip and drive there and go there? I said, yeah, of course. And if you look at it, it was empty. I was really surprised. Uh, you couldn't touch it because it was really high up. Uh, this is one of those liquid rocket boosters and that thing that's actually me. You can see how big it is. Uh, and this is the actual space potty from one of the uh, space shuttles. Some of these other things, of course, are not the real bubble, but this is just a nice small that they have. Again, not the real Viking, I think, but uh, a real space suit for one of the Apollo missions. We also got to stop by, and I'm sorry, this really doesn't have much to do with astronomy, but I could not resist. The very first Star Trek episode I ever saw was the one where Captain Kirk fought the Gorn. I went to the spot where Captain Kirk fought the Gorn. I was there, I can't believe it. <laughs> Um, and it was a really nice place. It's a public park where people can go. There was a, um, I think some high school kids that were there taking like, um, like prom photos or something. Um, and it's, it's just a really nice area. We also got to pass by the San Andreas Fault. And you can see these curvy sections of rock here where the fault is actually deeper down. But you can definitely see that the layers of the earth are getting all jumbled up. Uh, the whole area is actually really uh, filled with a lot of aerospace industry, technology, research, history, that kind of stuff. And you can see a couple of SM-71s there. Um, that's actually a pretty rare collection because there's two slightly different versions. There's a one-person version and a two-person version. Uh, and we got to see a shuttle, shuttle. Now, this is just parked in, you know, like a museum sort of setting, uh, but that was kind of neat to see too. Uh, there's a ton of other military aircraft that were there also, and I really like this one. This is a B-52, which is the kind of aircraft that my dad flew in the 60s, and these are still being used. Just the other day, the football game, I saw one on a flyover. So these things have been in the air for pushing 70 years. So our last touristy visit was to the Griffith Planetarium, and that was a really great place too. Uh, they, they do some public stuff where you, you look through telescopes, and there's almost nothing to see there because the light pollution is horrendous. Uh, the city is nice to look at, but all they can really show you are the planets in the moon. I love it. Uh, inside is a really nice museum, and I kind of like this picture here. This is one of my fellow teachers, and she's taking a photo of a camera, uh, taking an infrared picture of her. So that kind of thought that fit our like mission with infrared stuff. And I kind of like this for my astronomy classes. I wish we could have taken them there. It's a really huge HR diagram. If you're not familiar, that's kind of like the periodic table for astronomy, for stars, kind of. And, and you can look them up online, but this was just a nice thing to be in person. And lastly, as maybe you might know, Sophia is done with, unfortunately. All good things have to come to an end. It didn't break, uh, nothing bad happened. For the past two years before this, NASA put no money for Sophia in its budget. Congress, I don't know who, but Congress specifically said, oh no, we're writing in money for Sophia. So that happened for two years in a row. And that did not happen again. And the real reason they have ended it, and it is done flying missions now, I think it finished like maybe August or September or something like that of this year, um, is because of the amount of production of published papers that they got per money. 
So it was really just like a rating of it compared to other telescope systems like the bang for the buck. So as much as I liked it, you know, I realized that you know, things come to an end. And of course, the new one, the James Webb Telescope, has infrared astronomy too. Uh, however, the James Webb does do this amount of infrared wavelengths, where Sophia did this one over here. And so there is really a gap right now. Uh, does that mean that tons of things are invisible? Not necessarily, uh, but I'm sure that will get filled like in a decade or so when the next great thing goes up in space. So the end. Very good. Thank you. So seriously, any questions? What was the flight path like? You said they were flying around for 10 hours. Yeah, we went way up into Canada. I had to take my passport in case we landed in Canada so they would let me back in, like if we had an emergency landing. Um, we didn't do much over water, but a lot of times they do over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we did way up into Canada, came down like through the middle of the country, then went back over. And um, uh, one of the things that um, Sophia was really good for if on your way out, you want to take any of the stuff in the back there, please do. There's kind of like a big booklet back there that describes one of the missions that Sophia did or discovered the atmosphere on Pluto. And what it had to do was fly in a particular path so that like Pluto was basically um, uh, eclipsed or something. Uh, there's a little more to it than that, but one of the good things was you've got an observatory that can move around and go to different places, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, whatever. We don't have it right now, but there are a lot of good things that Sophia did. Some of the other things are finding water on the moon. You might have heard about that. Um, the very first picture it took was just of Jupiter, and that wasn't a special thing, but it just looked kind of nice. And there was a lot of good sort of less fancy science done in terms of spectroscopy and stuff like that. How many times did you go? I did two flights. So it was like one night, and then we got to sleep a little bit, and then we went again. Um, and, and that was just because like it worked out that way. Uh, sometimes some of the other teachers only got to do one. And then sometimes there are actually some teachers that went out there, did the trip, they flew to Los Angeles. And for whatever reason, they couldn't go on any flights. Uh, so then they usually recycled those teachers and got them another opportunity. And you might be wondering, well, what are they gonna do now? Because they're not putting teachers on Sophia, it's not flying. Uh, the, the consolation prize, if you want to call it that is, uh, this is all through SETI, not actually NASA. Um, some teachers will get to go to the infrared telescope facility, which is in Hawaii. So it's not a vacation. They actually stay in the dorms, like halfway up the mountain where the scientists stay. Um, but that's what they're going to start to do now. So going to Hawaii is not a bad second shot. Anybody want to look around with the camera? I'm just curious on the on that actual telescope, was it a mirror telescope? Yep. Yep. So when you're at negative 74 degrees, yep. how was the cooling period? What did you do to make the mirrors be able to? Uh, I think nothing actually. It was really? not cool, yeah. Because wow. it was all open. Okay. And um, actually, I thought you were going to ask about like turbulence or something. It's open to the air. We're flying at like what, 500 miles an hour or something. Yep. Um, and they actually built up part of the uh, outside so that there's a nice smooth flow, like a balance flow of air. So I'll just pass this around. You can take a look at yourself and whatever. It's on the screen. You can get whatever you want. You were saying a mirror or glass stops the infrared. Here's what I said. With the glass, it doesn't penetrate the infrared. But the mirror doesn't impede the infrared. But it yeah, it doesn't reflect off. The okay. Because it did look from photos, look like a plain old regular mirror. Wow. You said it was a larger mirror than all. 2.5 meters. 2.5. Yeah. So I think it's a smidge larger than all. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think the telescope, the, the mirror itself, is going back to Canada. They built it, I think, of taking it back. So they will read her out. I don't know. It's up to them. Um, you know. How much would a gizmo like this cost? Actually, I had one of them through school I, I, where I asked school to buy me one before I even did this. It's about $400. And then the, the program gave me a second one, which is the only reason I have two things. Uh, people use them actually for to see if your ventilation system's working. Is there hot or cold air coming out? In the camera with that. Look at your windows to see if you've got drafts where you're losing energy. 
use a camera like that. Um, if you're a mechanic and you're looking at parts of an engine that are running too hot or something, use that because you can't like take a thermometer and shove it on an engine or anything. Can you, can you take the uh, camera trained on uh, the vent? I know you said it's one megapixel, but that's you know, beyond our 90 seconds. Yeah, let's, I'll see if I can do the same thing. Still on. So we're back to looking at the table stuff. Now we're looking up at the vent. And look at that, the vent looks really cold. So the here. Or at least you know, there's the hot air isn't coming out of there. Uh, you can see some things like, well, obviously all of you. Um, sometimes you can see things like a computer. Look at the heat that's coming off the computer from like the, the wasted, like the thermal loss from the circuitry. Sometimes even outlets. No, not that one. Sometimes outlets look a little bit hot. Yeah, I don't know. Um, can you see right above Elon, there's that camera above him? It seems to be a little bit hot from whatever it's running. It's hot. Wow. That's incredible. So, so it seems like we have more heat here. Well, we're, we're being insulated because of our clothes. Like uh, a very awkward thing that sometimes when you look at females with this, I'm just trying to be real scientific here. If they're wearing a bra, that keeps the heat in. So you can kind of see that. You're not seeing through their clothes, you're seeing where the heat from their body is not coming out. So like that one picture of that female student that I had, I just do them from like here up. <laughs> and you were talking about the wavelengths. Um, yeah. Could you, could you uh, mention that again? I, I don't know if you have the numbers off the top of your head. No, I don't. Okay. Yeah, I don't. So, they also don't do like uh, nanometers or meters like I'm used to for physics. They like to use microns. And so that's kind of hard for me to like translate in my head. Negative six. Instead of meters, yeah. And, and I know I can do it. It's just yeah. like when they yeah. say yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, you can definitely look that up, especially like if you look up James Webb, you can see probably the wavelengths that it looks at. What was your favorite part of flying on Sophia it, it was kind of like the whole thing. Like, I felt like I was getting to do this thing that was like, I never thought I would do. Like very few people do get to do. Usually it's like maybe 20 teachers a year that get to do this. So it was kind of like just being there. Um, and maybe one of the things I didn't expect, the two telescope operators, the, the younger ladies that I said, I was talking to them about their educational path, like what schools they went to and stuff. And um, I got them to be in contact with some of my students that want to go into astronomy. So they get to talk to like an actual person that's been there and done that and, you know, get some firsthand advice. Sort of writing for astronomy with an ice cube. Um, you have the hot and cold sample there. Yeah. Um, Guess how, how exact does it need to be? Um, if you look at the screen, it like usually gives you a little scale on the side um, and it's pretty rough. It's like, you know, a certain number of degrees. Yeah, like, like what I'm looking at right now goes from like 13 degrees to 26 degrees. Okay, that's so that's like the, the bracket. Oh, cool, I get it, cool. Uh, there you go. So you mentioned there was a gap now. Yeah. So since Sophia stopped. Yep. Because um, you can't see certain wavelengths from the ground. And James Webb gets certain ones, but James Webb doesn't get all infrared. I don't think they get the near infrared. They get mid and far. So now we're looking for more infrared telescopes. Uh, yeah, but, but I think that's more of a process. Like somebody's going to propose it. And then they'll like think about it for two years and they'll build it for 10 years. So this is like a real long ranging next generation thing. Even Sophia, this was such a nice, you know, thing. Uh, they actually did stuff like this, I would say back in the 50s maybe, where they had telescopes that were like really small. They just flew up in an airplane and like, you know, couldn't do nearly the same things, but then they got bigger and better. 
and you kind of from Sophia kind of to James Webb. So just stay on your feet. To click that. So, uh, was this your play pack? No, I don't think so. Okay. Yes. I didn't go was. So um, it always takes different play packs. Always different. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, that's one of the things they talk about. Like they can't go over like restricted airspace. Um, like certain areas they just don't want to go over for like whatever observation reason. Um, so that's why they've got all these sort of jumbled lines. You might think one well, is going to go in a straight line and come back, or maybe even do a circle or something, but then you wouldn't be aiming at the same spot. So not like a big octagon. Maybe a real big one, yeah, yeah. So that was one way? Yeah, I'm not sure which one. Okay. Yeah, the first mission was kind of like, oh, I just wanted to see everything. And then the second one, I got to talk to people more and learn a lot of stuff. One thing I didn't mention, they had a really interesting system on the, um, the telescope, which they called a mechanical vibration dampening system. So they put like different masses on the telescope and adjusted where they're at really quickly in time to dampen the vibration so that it would be a better image. It, I, I kind of like it like adaptive optics, but not with light, with like masses. It was kind of like an inertia dampening system. Which unfortunately, they were kind of pioneering that when I was on it. So they only got to use it for a few months and then it's done. Yeah, yeah. And that's when I was maybe not paying attention to that everything. Very cool. Any other questions? Oh, and please, well, like I said, all the stuff in the back, you're welcome to take anything you want. What's up? The picture you show in the museum in California, like, like the picture of one of the Apollo capsules. Yeah. Was that a real one? Or a yeah, one? it was on loan from the Smithsonian, I think. Do you know which one it was? No, I don't. I can oh. maybe you could zoom in close to the picture, but I don't know if I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one was real. I like yeah. it. The spacesuit was real, the capsule was real, the toilet was real, um, <laughs> the, the space shuttle was real. Uh, but then they had a lot of other displays that, are, of course, were like the scaled down versions of the probes and stuff like that. What can they actually see through the, the, the whole mission? Yeah, the moon plants. That's the only thing they were showing people. Uh, actually, no, I, I mean, they showed like, I think at the time, Vega. So, like, we're getting a star, one of the very few stars you can see from there. Yeah. And, and then to do that, they had a nice big uh, 11 inch Celestron, and it was a little overkill for just looking at the star. But... Okay. I just looked up Sophia Telescope. Mm -hmm. Wow, there's a lot to go back on. It's interesting that uh, so they stopped flying these missions. I'm curious if they'll refit the plane to make passengers or if they'll put another scientific mission on board. They could do either one, but I haven't heard of either of that, so I just don't know. I was told by like a high up administrator when we were there that uh, they're trying to basically place everybody. So that we shouldn't worry about, you know, some scientist or engineer that's now on the void because there's plenty of other places to put them that might involve moving and maybe even a slightly different field, but it's good that they're going somewhere, the people. I wonder what we can set the work for. So once you get up to altitude, they roll up into the work? Yeah. What was that moment like? Well, I'm not even sure I knew when they did it. Like, it's not like they made an announcement or anything. Yeah, just, oh, yeah, we're doing it. And, and they did observations fairly early, like before it even got dark. When I showed that picture of San Francisco, it was kind of like twilight. They're already observing. So they're like collecting photons from something, even though it's not entirely dark. So with infrared, would they be able to do that during the day? I'm not sure that that's, well, they, they don't, because um, they only fly at night. 
maybe it's so saturated by all the sun that it's you know blotted out. Um, yeah, so the infrared from the sun. Yeah. Yeah, and so they, they squeezed every minute of nighttime um, uh, flight out. Uh, if you were landing really close to sunrise, sunrise like, like I was, they had special protocols so that they made sure that they didn't like accident and point the telescope at the sun. Because, you know, like they don't do that with Hubble, I'm sure they don't want to do that with a big telescope. <clears throat> And anything else at all you want to I appreciate everybody's interest and attention and questions. No, it's just an amazing achievement to be able to stabilize that. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I even asked the question like, I had a lot of uh, Zoom meetings before we went to do this. We did a lot of background and training and stuff. And I think I asked the question once and I didn't really get a great answer. And it wasn't until I was literally there looking at that thing that I understood how they were like stabilizing it. And even then, it was like, wow, really? Yeah. Like, who would have like dreamt up the idea in the first place that I'm going to build, we are going to build this, and it's going to be aimed at something and not jiggle around? Nah, you're full of it. That'll never work. <laughs> but at least at those al altitudes, you have less turbulence than at yeah. lower yeah. atmosphere. Yeah. The one, the one mission we did was very smooth. You didn't feel anything. The second one it was bumpy. Okay. And like I said, we lost something like 20 minutes of time, but then they positioned the telescope real quick to like get that time back in effect. Yeah, so you're dealing with basically jet streams. <laughs> when did how how long was the telescope in operation? I think a little over a decade. a decade. They like did it for maybe even like a whole year where they worked the bugs out and stuff. And then it operated for a good decade or so. And, and now it's done. Yeah, it's its first light was 2010. I mean, maybe the airplane was flying in 2007. Like, I'm sure they did a lot of work on it. Like uh, several years we operated for it. I know we did do a lot. Um, for my classes, I had to do sort of like a little uh, unit about this. And one of the things was my students reading about a few different missions to see like what they learned from it. And it was geared towards high school students where it wasn't super techy and it wasn't like really low either. And I think all the students really liked that they learned about this stuff that really got done that was like not just out of a book or something, it was some kind of real science that people did that I had, you know, a little bit of a chance to experience. Okay, lots of uh, more information to dig into. I guess the uh, first flight of the plane was back in 77. Yeah, and I think it was called like, it was named after Charles Lindbergh, I think. Yeah. Um, it was like his his, uh, his widow christened the airplane when it was built, you know, put into service. Oh, um, yep. Yeah. Very cool. So there's so much NASA history and all these other missions that we don't really think about when we think about telescopes. You don't think about a plane that rolls the door open. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> the telescope. Question Over your years of teaching, have you seen a difference in the number of young women that are interested in science? Not so much. Not? Yeah. Um, my whole career, I taught physics, and that's always been really low for females. Um, I've had many AP physics classes, maybe not many, I've had several AP physics classes that have been all boys, not one single girl. And maybe there's a little bit more, but there's not a lot more. So it's not a huge difference. I know. But on the other hand, like I said, uh, on these two missions, yeah. the two people that were running the telescope were both females. Um, one of the principal investigators that I think maybe was working on a PhD didn't have yet, that was a female. Um, the pilot for one of the missions, she was a female. Uh, so it's it's not like it's You're just nice possible to get into it. Just it's just not I teach at Wilson, so that's oh. relatively near. I'm sorry, was that another? 
No, I just said not at Wilson. That's <laughs> not exactly in the sticks. Yeah. I mean, I would say there's a lot more females in biology, and there's a little less in chemistry, and there's a, a lot less in physics. So it seems like they're leaning more towards biological sciences and less towards physics. And I hope that's not just me. I kind of think that is a general thing. Like when I went to school for engineering or physics, it was 90% more. Very cool. Uh, before I jump into a Star Trek pen tangent, uh, <laughs> is this about the Gorn? It has rocks. Yeah, I, I see a uh, Star Trek actress, Michelle Nichols. I, I saw her signature on a part of Sophia that she signed when she was on it. Uh, maybe it doesn't say on there, but I know that when she was on board Sophia, she smuggled a bunch of tribbles and would hide them in places on the airplane. <laughs> Um, they let her go on the airplane for basically a fun ride, even though she was very physically infirm. They could hardly get her up the steps to do it. They never should have let her do that because if there would have been an emergency, she would have never been able to evacuate. Uh, but because she's been so really good with promoting science, that they figured they kind of like owed it to her. And so that's why she got the law. Yeah, she's a big investment. Yep. Keith Duda, thank you so much for doing awesome. Thank Thanks a lot.